do, though, in talking about Adam and what he's meant to me, is that in, in many respects, uh, the thing about Adam that is he has a lot of character, right? And uh, I encountered a poem recently, and it's by Mother Teresa of Calcutta, and it's actually on her home for children, and I thought I would read that to you guys tonight uh, to introduce Adam. And the poem goes like this. Uh, it's, first of all, it's called Do It Anyway, which is kind of the spirit, I think, of the conference. It goes like this. People are often unreasonable, irrational, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, People may accuse you of selfish and ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some unfaithful friends and some genuine enemies. Succeed anyway. If you are honest and sincere, people may deceive you. Be honest and sincere anyway. What you spend years creating, others could destroy overnight. Create anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, some may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good that you to do today will often be forgotten. Do good anyway. Give the best that you have, and it will never be enough. Give your best anyway. In the final analysis, it is between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. Adam points. Don't cry, Adam. I'm gonna take the mic out and drop it down. <laughs> I want to uh, start by reading you a letter. We're going to get a lot of literature tonight, it sounds like. This is not by me. It's from a colleague of mine that I admire a lot. <clears throat> I admit it. You intimidate me. Your work is vivid and imaginative, far superior to my willful scratchings at a similar age. The things I struggle to learn barely make you sweat. One day, you'll be a better designer than me. But for now, but for now, I can claim to my sole advantage. The one thing that makes me more valuable, I get results. I can put a dent in cast iron CEO arguments. I can spot risks and complications months in advance. In the wager that is design, I usually bet on the right color. People trust me with their stake, so if you'll humor me, maybe I can offer a few suggestions to speed you toward the inevitable. Slow down. You're damn talented, but in your eagerness to prove it, you sometimes rush toward a solution. You pluck an idea from the branch and throw it onto the plate before it has time to ripen. Don't mistake speed for precocity. The world doesn't need wrong answers in record time. Perhaps your teachers exalted the idea as the gem of creative work, taught you the idea is the hard part. I disagree. Ideas aren't to be trusted. They need to be run dry, ripped apart. We have the rare luxury that our professional diligence often equates to playfulness to do our job properly. We must disassemble our promising ideas and make them into something better. The process feels mechanical and awkward initially. In time, the distinction between idea and the iteration will blur, and eventually the two become one. So go deeper. Squander loose time on expanding your ideas. Even if you're sure you're perfect, even if you're sure they're perfect or useless, look closely at decisions you think are trivial, and I guarantee you'll find better solutions around the corner. Think it through. We love to believe design speaks for itself, but a large part of the job is helping others hear its voice. Persuasive rationale, the why to your work, is what turns a great document into a great product. If you haven't already, sometime in your career you'll meet an awkward son of a bitch who wants to know why every pixel is where you put it. 
you should be able to articulate that answer to the, for that person. Every pixel. What does this line do? Well, it defines. It distinguishes. But why here? Why that color? Why that thickness? It looks better, won't suffice. You'll need a rationale that explains hierarchy, balance, gestalt. In other words, esoteric ways to say it looks better. <laughs> but ways that reassure stakeholders that you, that you understand the foundations of your craft. Similarly, be sure that you can explain which alternatives you rejected and why. Working this through will also help you see if you've been diligent or if you've been clinging to a pet idea. That might sound political. It is. Politics is just the complex art of navigating teams and people, and the more senior you get, the more time you'll spend with people. Temper your passion. Your words matter. Be careful not to get carried away. Passion is useful, but you'll be more effective when you demonstrate the evidence behind your beliefs rather than the strength of those beliefs. Softer language earns fewer retweets, but better results. If you have a hunch, call it a hunch. It shows honesty, and it leaves you headroom to be unequivocal about the things you are sure of. Similarly, your approach to your work will change. Right now, it's an ache. You see all the brokenness in the world, stupid products, trivial mistakes, bad designs propped up with scribble corrections. The stupidity never goes away, but in time you learn how to live with it. What matters is your ability to change things. Anyone can complain about the world, but only a good few can fix it. That fury and that energy fades with time, until the question becomes one of choosing which battles to arm yourself for and which to surrender. Often this means gravitating toward the biggest problems as you progress in the field. Your attention may turn from tools and techniques to values and ethics. The history of the industry is instructive. Give it proper attention. After all, all our futures shrink with time until finally the past becomes all we have. You'll come to appreciate that it can be better to help others reach the right outcomes themselves than to do it yourself. That, of course, is what we call leadership. Finally, there may come a point when you realize you're better served by thinking less about design. Work and life should always be partially separate, so there's no doubt that the experiences you have in your life shape your work, too. So please remember to be a broad, wise human being. Travel thoughtfully as much as you can. Read literature. A good novel will sometimes teach you more than another design book can. Remind yourself that the sea exists. You'll notice the empathy, sensitivity, cunning, and understanding you develop make your working life better too. But you're smart. And of course you realize this is really a letter to the younger me. And alongside it's a lament at my nagging sense of obsolescence, the angst of a few gray hairs and the emerging trends I don't quite understand, which is mildly ridiculous at my age. But this is a mildly ridiculous industry. And you'll inherit it all in time. Good luck, yours, Kenneth. Kenneth Bowles is a designer and a favorite speaker of mine. He is uh, and he's also an author, and uh, he published this letter on a list of art. And I thought it was probably one of the most thoughtful expressions of caring advice I ever read. I felt like it perfectly set the tone for what I'm going to talk about today. So while that all sinks in. Uh, shift gears with me for a couple of minutes. In 1963, the Dallas Morning News was uh, getting ready for the visit for President Kennedy's visit to the city. <coughs> and they planned on printing a map of his parade route in the paper. <coughs> there was a young creative director there at the time who suggested that they not do it because he felt like it was a security risk. They didn't follow his advice, and they printed it anyway. Next day, on November 22nd, that creative director walked out of a storeroom that was in the school book depository where the Morning News had offices. And shortly after, a stranger walked into that room and took up a position where you could see the motorcade. From that window, he shot the President of the United States and he put Dallas on the map in the most horrific way possible. That creative director was investigated by the FBI, who was found not to have anything to do with, with the circumstances. But 
it's hard to wonder what this turning point in history might have meant if they hadn't printed that map and listened to that creative director. The creative director's name was Max Wallace. And for about in the 50s and 60s, he was the art photography director for the Dallas Morning News. And he spent about 11 years then as the creative director for the Sales Corporation. That's not him. I could not, I don't have a picture of him. I couldn't find him. But what he really liked to do was teach. And rather than go take a position at a university, he opened up a small agency and he hired schmucks like me that he thought might have a little promise. And uh, that was me in 1982 when I went to work for Max Wallace at a small agency and I got to work for a very remarkable man. Um, if I were talking to a younger me, it would be this time. <laughs> <laughs> With a lot of hair. <laughs> but from Max, I learned about typography, I learned about creative design, I learned about pay stuff, I learned about photography, uh, everything you could learn about the creative side of the advertising industry. There were no computers then. Now, my dad was in advertising. He was a marketing PR guy and there were guys that he hung around with that I remember growing up, and they did not look like Don Draper or David Ogilvy. <laughs> they looked a little more like this guy. <laughs> they smelled like cigarettes and hair cream. Uh, they were loud. Their suits never quite fit, and they were always a little frantic. Max was not anything like Don Draper either, but he wasn't like this guy either. He was the most unadvertising like guy that I ever ever knew. He was this tall, lanky East Texan. He spoke with a slow drawl. He was calm. Nothing ever got him upset. He never raised his voice. He never got upset with me. God knows I deserved it. But <clears throat> he was also willing to let you think he was as country as he could possibly be. Most of the time, he was the smartest guy in the room. He wasn't impressed by uh, any kind of self-importance. He was probably way more influential than he ever let on. And I can remember seeing him talk to somebody about a campaign or something, and the client would be panicking. He would just stand there and smile, nod. And uh, the closest thing he came to advertising, he smoked our freight train, he drank coke like they're going to put a major tomorrow. But he always smiled, he was always smiling, and he would kind of take a draw on a cigarette while his client was going out of his mind and just look over at me and wink. <laughs> This is what my desk looked like. So I had our board, I had French curves, I had all of the tools and the color wheels and the proportion wheels and all the stuff that we used to, to work on the design that we have today. But I also had had there were two of us in the art department. And for a while we thought it was really cool to take our exacto knives and toss them at the other guy's desk. <laughs> <laughs> we kind of like that thump you know, <laughs> The problem with that was we were going through exacto blades at a pretty crazy rate. <laughs> and one day Max came in with a cardboard and some cheap darts, and he had Xeroxed the uh, rules of game called cricket out of the Encyclopedia Britannica. And he said, You know, you guys are using up a lot of blades. Next time you feel like throwing your knives around, just get up and play a game of cards. So we were pretty good at it. And, you know, if we felt like throwing sharp objects around the room, we could get up and play a game of darts. But the most important thing about that dartboard is the best creative decisions. Best creative conversations I had were standing around that dartboard, getting up out of your desk, getting out of your head, and doing something a little different. Thinking about creativity while you did other things was this is where that started for me. So, Brian asked me to do the presentation, and I thought, okay, well, I got a lot of stuff in the can, I could probably draw for something. And I thought, you know, I can't rehash any of that stuff. This is, I, I can't come in here and talk about, you know, just what I've been thinking about lately, or what pisses me off right now, or just, you know, the things that I'm thinking about in the industry that I'm looking forward to. I need to cast a little broader net. And then I ran across something online that reminded me of Max, and made me think about all of the lessons that I've learned from this guy. 
how I can trace what I do today, over 30 years later, all the way back to the time that I spent working for this remarkable man. And they not only were good design lessons, uh, they were they were good lessons in general. And I want to share some of those with you. We had a client that was a cookie shop. And we did their print advertising for them, and we did uh, you know, radio spots and stuff like that. And they often would do uh, on site promotions. And whenever we had to go out and do an on site promotion, we made sure we never carried less than three cameras. One would be in black and white, one would have color film, and the other would have a film that was either a little bit faster or a little bit slower, depending on what the light was like that day. And the reason for that, it sounds a little archaic, the reason for that is. With all this stuff going on all around us all the time, we needed to be able to pick up a camera, point it, aim it, you know, focus it, shoot. You know, we don't have to do that. Just pick it up and shoot. But the whole thing is moments were happening, and we needed to be ready to capture those moments, not to screw around with our equipment. So plan ahead. Do you have your stuff? Do you have your materials? Do you have your equipment? Do you have stuff in reserve? Are you uh, ready to go? Can you predict what's going to happen every time you go out into the field? No, you can't. But over time, experience is going to teach you what to have. <coughs> so plan ahead. Check your gear. <coughs> because if you don't, somebody is going to have to take what you're working with, whatever it is you've given them, and they're going to have to make something out of it. And if you haven't planned ahead, you're going to be standing there at the end of the press and something is going to come off it and you're not going to get a really bad surprise. So, this may sound a little harsh, but if you want to sign your work at the bottom, go find a coffee shop and hand your stuff up there. Max used to say, this is advertising. The client does not give two shits about your portfolio. I live with phrases like, I'll know it when I see it. I would spend days going through pages and pages and pages of layout screen, of layout pad, trying to come up with some design, you know, hearing stuff like, wow, that's great. Do you have anything else? So I live with that crowd. I still do, I still do sometimes. But once I found something, something that struck a particular chord, they would then pick it up and then go show it around to show everybody what they designed. It's kind of heartbreaking for a young designer. But what was really heartbreaking about it is that somewhere along the way you lost your point of view and you knew it and you felt crappy about it because you basically let them put handcuffs on your work. The most paradoxical thing about the work that I began to do under Max and that I do today is that even though I felt like I had those handcuffs on, as time went by, the less married I got to my ideas, the better I got at defending them. Because I was open to hearing about the changes, but I got better at defending my point of view and I had, I, I made, I had to make less changes as a result. Practice, no downtime. If you love your craft, if you're going to practice your craft, especially if you're going to charge for your craft, get your sketchbook out. Go burn up some film. Go write something. Go code something. But find an opportunity to continue to practice and repeat your work at a fair as music or sports or a creative endeavor. Practice gets certain tasks into the back of your mind. And when that happens, that leads in front of your mind for you to be more deliberate about the stuff that you want to do. It lets you experiment. It lets you, uh, it really lets you be creative. In 1902, there was a young American engineer by the name of Willis Carrier. And he was on a train platform, and he was watching the fog roll across the tracks. And he got the idea, fog is what happens when warm air you know, cools rapidly. 
He came up with the idea essentially for the condenser. He invented the air conditioner. Now, in the world of innovation, where people write and talk about these things, this is considered to be one of the greatest eureka moments, one of the few eureka moments that ever really happened in the world of great ideas. But I would argue with that a little bit. He was an engineer. To even stand there on the platform and equate seeing fog with the notion of something like a condenser, he had to be an engineer. He had to spend time becoming a good engineer in order to even have that idea. So my question here is, was it really a unique moment? We're in the business of ideas. And innovation is as much about the ones you throw away as it is and the energy that it took to come up with them as it is about one great idea. Max taught me to get your ideas out. Look at them, toss them aside, but go back because somewhere in that pile of cast offs, maybe a few good ideas, and within those few good ideas, there may be one golden idea. There may be one golden concept, but innovation is about having the presence of mind to capture those concepts so that you can examine them, you can break them down, you can hold them up and kind of look at them and decide if there's anything of value in them. There may be something that has legs, or you may just toss it aside. It may be something that uh, you can deliver on. When I was a kid, I remember announcing to my dad that I wanted to be an idea man. Thought the guy would come unglued. He went into great detail to explain to me how idea men were a dime a dozen. And the people in a premium were the ones that could carry ideas through to uh, uh, through to finality. He insisted that I remember this forever in my life. Now my mind was kind of cluttered when I was six, <laughs> <laughs> but for some reason it stuck. <clears throat> in a way, you do want to be an idea man you or an idea person. You want to come up with as many as you possibly can, but. The idea, like Kenneth said in his letter, is not really the thing. It's what you do with them. When I was working for Max, and during that time I was actually taking some art classes in art school, they would give you an apple to draw. Not art, apples are red. They got kind of pitched at the bottom, they got a stem that comes out the top, right? Wrong. That's the apple you walk around with in your brain. What an apple really looks like is this wonderful collection of textures and variation in color. And when you're sitting, when you have to sit down and draw that apple, what you need to do is you have to look at the apple that's in front of you because it's unique. It's not that one you walk around with in your head. Dealing with people in business is the same thing. You get an idea in business about the marketing guy, or the lady in finance, or the damn developers. And you think you know them, and you think you understand them, but the thing is you have to look at them too, and you have to meet them, you have to listen to them, you have to understand their sensibilities. Because just like the Apple, when you look at the information in front of them, they may run true to stereotype, but you gotta give them the opportunity to break down. And if you do, you may find an ally, or you may find a collaborator, or you didn't expect to find one. Most of my work took place on 10 by 13 pieces of crescent board, or pesto board. And it's this thick board with one very bright white side. And even the time prepping for them, the way we did, was a little old school, even at the time. We used to have to cut them up, and when we were going to use them, we cut from these large parent sheets. And using my T square, I would line them on my desk, and I would mark them up with mark out an eight and a half by eleven space, because that's you know that was that's typical letter size, uh, with a blue pencil, because the camera doesn't see a blue pencil. Uh, put registration marks out there out on the outside corner so that you could see them. You take them down on the drawing board. You marked out your space. Uh, and then I would draw these pages out. And I'm totally drawn blank. 
<laughs> so the finished piece is what we call camera ready art. We get that camera ready art might consist of hand drawn art, uh, live trade. If you had it, if you had to do a form, you had to draw it out by hand with pedograph pens. <clears throat> or it might have the text laid out. The text was fun. But you have to have this foundation to your work. And the reason text was fun is because of this fun thing. It's a copy graphic for what I used to call the Blue Monster. We had seven fonts. The ones we used most often were Helvetica and Optima. When I was typing my font, I'm typing, doing my typesetting in this machine, the only thing that I could look at was a little Times Square light. It was about that big. It was going by a little band. I could, just like you do today, I could change my font size. I could uh, change the letting and the kerning. I could adjust the text any way that I needed to. The only thing is I needed to know in advance what I had to do with that thing. <coughs> today, you can put it into a document. You can possibly around with it as much as you want, change it however you need to, drop it other fonts. I had to know before I did this because what happened is through a photographic process, these letters were shot onto a piece of film that went into a drum. The drum had to come out the side of the machine. And you went into the dark room and you stuck it in another machine that ran it through the uh, uh, photo development process. And it came out the other way and this big long wet strip of stuff and you hoped to hell it was a pipe. You carried it back over to your art board and you pasted it down with wax or a rubber cement. And then you carved with your exacto knife, you cut out either paragraphs of text if you're really good, or lines of text, or words, or individual letters. And that was how you got your, that was how you did your typeset. You pasted it down on the board. If you didn't have the foundation laid out with your glue pencil, if you didn't have some sense of what this final design was going to look like, you were going to be screwed. Because you were going to be back there running through the typesetter again. They say the best evangelist isn't one who tells you how to act, but shows you through their actions, their own behavior. I never knew Max's politics. Uh, I never knew anything about his religion. But I knew he was patient. As long as I knew Max, he never lost his temper with me. His wife said that in 50 years, she saw him get mad once. And she knew because she saw his jaw clench up for a moment. Not everybody cares about things the same way you do as much as you do. You need to try to understand their passions and where their pain lies. Because just about everything that motivates people boils down to two things. They're either trying to avoid pain, or they're seeking pleasure. If you can help them make one go away or achieve the other, you're going to begin to gain trust. And trust is what we need in the design world to do our jobs. The reason for that is because everybody knows in any project there are three things that drive it. There is the time, there's the cost, and the quality. Well, time is usually owned by the development team. Those guys have an opaque skill set. Nobody looks over their shoulder and says, you know, can you make that a little bigger? <laughs> the guys with the money look at the world through a spreadsheet. They think you can break down in little pieces parts and you can adjust those pieces parts and you can roll them all back together and have something much better at the other end. They also love cause and effect. This thing you do here is going to make you or lose you this much money. We deal in quality. The effects of bad quality are out here somewhere. The effects of money and time are right here. So those are the guys we're up against. User experience and design of any kind needs a level of protection. And they need somebody to stand behind it to get all the other folks to suspend belief for just a little while, long enough for you to prove the value of what you're doing. You're not going to get to do that if you can't build trust. And you're not going to build trust if you don't think of it. You're not patient with people. If you're not patient with them, you're never going to get the understanding of what their pain is or what makes them happy. 
so you got to have <coughs> My own journey out of the design world has had a patchwork of successes and failures. And no matter where I found myself, Max always came to mind when I faced challenges. In a way, he remained my mentor. The journey really is the thing. And I know that that, like most of the other stuff that I've told you about, are things you've heard before and read before. What I'm telling you are the stories about how I learned them and this guy that I learned them from. If you pay attention, you'll notice you're going to be surrounded by people who know where you're going. They don't have to be older than you. And maybe you'll have a great mentor. You might have to go look for one. But you all have access to information. And it wasn't as easy to find back then. But go find it. Go read it. And go listen to it because you can still learn from the experience of others. So over the years, I lost touch with Max. And I tried to locate him from time to time. And I didn't have any luck until one day I found him online. And it was his, it was his obituary. And he passed away maybe two months before I found out. There wasn't a whole lot of evidence of him out there he lived that kind of life. But I sat back in my chair. And I thought about how for a lot of years I really thought I'd squandered my time with him, that I could have learned more from him, that I could have done more for him, that, that I must have disappointed him. And then I realized something else. My feelings were rooted back in the 1980s when I was working with him. And I may have disappointed him back in 1984, but I think that it just took longer for a lot of those lessons to take, and moreover, I think he knew that, because he knew what he was dealing with. So if I could talk to a younger me, I would tell me this last lesson. And in 1983, I was hanging out with models and other creatives, and I was running hard in Dallas and at night, and I didn't have the wing line to get the good clubs. And I was an arrogant little shit who thought he'd arrived. <laughs> the truth is, I was years and miles away from success. So I'm here today. My family's not rich. Uh, the house needs work. Our relatives make us crazy. <laughs> That shit's in the garage. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been married for 22 years for the love of my life. I have a daughter who has made me forget or care about what it was like not to be a dad. I work in a field that has one of the most welcoming professional communities. And I work in a place that drives me to be better than I am at things I love with people that I respect and are doing amazing things from their hearts and for those reasons if the music stopped right now, I can say that I was successful. But I'm still on the journey. And that success did. So I roamed around a little bit, talked about a lot of things. And if you're looking for some sort of comprehensive uh, guide to something, I, I never plan to offer you that. <laughs> And maybe I was lucky. But if I think I think if I were if, if I were prepared when the opportunities came along, um, I think by being prepared when opportunities came along, I think we make our own luck. So I learned a lot of lessons over the years. And uh, I, I have many more to learn. I've had more teachers than I can count, and I still do. They're supervisors and peers, they're acquaintances close friends. But Max was special. As was the time I spent under his guidance. And like I said, lessons didn't all take right away. And I had to remind myself to practice some of them as I go. But as I re-examine them now, 
I suppose they're as meaningful to a good life as they are to good design. So I wish you all that same life.